calling me. She's like, where are you? I'm waiting for you. Ah, okay. Uh, in a panic, I turned off a bunch of things everywhere. So now I have to sort of reset, reset up my stream a little. Uh, so give me a second here while I do that. Let's do an intermission here. Uh, right. We're looking for my dashboard, stream manager. Move this over here. Uh, okay. So that stays here and I need my timer, which goes over here. Probably should reset it back to 10 minutes. Okay. So, I think everything's set up the way it should be. Let's go back to learning. So we left off with loops. Wait, I'm also missing my music. There we go. Uh, hopefully it's not too loud. It's like my audio settings got jumbled up as well. Because for some reason, Skype doesn't like my microphone. Uh, let's see. Input. That's fine. Output. That's fine. Should have probably done a test recording before this, but it is what it is. Do do do. Do do do. All right. Ugh. <clears throat> uh, what happened? <laughs> I forgot that I had a therapy appointment today. And my therapist was calling me. Where the hell are you? So I had to quickly end the stream and hop on to Skype. For an hour of therapy session. shouldn't be a problem in the future that was this today was the last last barred bar some some problems psychological problems in the future today should should have been the last session breathe in breathe out uh, more like, think about what you're thinking about, so that it doesn't give you the big sad. I mean, it works. I, I, due to those therapy sessions, I was able to, uh, to sort of, Yeah, T TBSD. Uh, I was able to even consider pivoting towards programming. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have been able to. I would still be stuck at a job I hate, working night shifts, and being miserable. Whereas now I'm fairly happy. I'm doing what I like. 
uh, yeah, I'm streaming, which is also a thing that I, I wanted to do for a while. And I tried to do multiple times back in the day, but uh, just because of T TBSD, couldn't. Both physically and mentally. Yeah, especially especially the fact that I'm sticking with it, you know, uh, because I tried learning programming multiple times back in the past and I couldn't stick with it. And now I'm sticking with it for the past half a year and and still uh, maintaining the same uh, the same amount of motivation and the same amount of fun that I get out of it. Which is an awesome feeling, to be honest. Back to reading about typewriters and punch cards. Why are you reading about time typewriters and punch cards? Like, as in actual physical typewriters and punch cards where they would use to punch out their working hours? Or is that some kind of programming lingo that I don't understand? Have I have ever heard a chain printer? No. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, one second. I'm gonna turn off the music so I can hear it clearly. Let's take a look. Wow, that's a printer. Holy shit. Excuse my language. Printed at laser jet speeds before ink. Damn. That's some awesome stuff. So, okay, so how would you go about, so I assume you program what you print, is that the case? Like I'm, I'm trying to think of how it, how it would work. Because in a normal typewriter, you just click the key and it gets punched into the paper, but in that thing's case, you have to probably program out whatever you need to print, right? So that the printer knows, like, you punch characters on an 80 line punch card with a special... Oh! Okay, that makes sense. Then it reads the sheets of paper using women. <laughs> yeah, the, the infamous NASA computers, women in the 60s.
Okay, let's make sure everything is back to how it was pre-stream. And we'll be able to go back to learning. Uh, each card can hold a line. Deleting a line is as easy as throwing a card out. But correcting a character, you need a special type, special hardware for copying stuff. Okay. Yeah, because then it would have to read the card and also input the changes. I don't know, like just imagining myself trying programming back in the day, it's, it's mind boggling. I mean, I understand uh, how people did it, but it just seems way, way harder. It was a fun interlude after explaining Metacircular Lisp Evaluator. Kek, are you just trying to confuse me with fancy words? Because I, I have no idea what the hell... Okay, let's... I, I will meta... Circular... Lisp... Ev evaluator. I can barely write that. In computing, a metacircular evaluator or a metacircular interpreter is an interpreter which defines each feature of the interpreted language using a similar facility of the interpreter's host language. For example, interpreting a Lambda application may be implemented using function of... No idea what I just read. Am I interested in metaprogramming? Dude, I don't even know what metaprogramming is. Okay, yeah, just it just vomited a scientific paper at me. Nope, I ref I refuse. I'm learning about loops. This is my level of of knowledge at the moment. <clears throat> you stick with your meta programming and meta circular Lisp evaluators and all that complicated stuff and i'll stick with my loops and in javascript okay what is this now an hour <laughs> an hour and a half long youtube video on the most beautiful program ever written It's entertainment. Okay, I will bookmark this and I watch. I will watch this at my leisure, maybe taking a bath or something. But for now, we're going back to hungry. No, then you're full. And if if you are hungry, you eat. And then if if you're still hungry, you eat again until you're yes don't expect to understand that's how i did it for years i mean i i'm i'm already doing that with some of the stuff that i watch too my my main method of falling asleep is <clears throat> is watching restoration videos of old uh hand tools and i don't understand a thing that i'm looking at but it's entertaining and it helps me fall asleep recommend something uh there's a cool um there's a cool creator uh hand tool rescue uh hand tool rescue here this guy he has a good sense of um uh, comedy and it's not one of those like fake restoration videos where you know they just fake the whole thing he's actually like taking old ass uh hand tools and he's restoring them but also like recreating patents of old tools uh 
like this fractal vice, right? This is pretty cool. Restoring that. Or like taking old patents and remaking them. Or like a fractal chair. So that's pretty cool. So this is he's my go-to guy. Wait, was there? Uh, where was it? I th I know he has something with IBM. Wait. Yeah. Your sister loves it? Well, glad I was of use. Okay. Uh, loops. So, a loop is a programming tool that repeats a set of instructions until a specified condition called a stopping condition is reached. As a programmer, programmer you'll find that you rely on loops all the time. You'll hear the generic term iterate when referencing to loops, when ref when referring to loops, iterate simply means to repeat. Okay, that's pretty standard stuff about loops. Nothing we should hang on to for now. So, before we write our own loops, let's take a moment to develop an appreciation for loops. The best way to do that is by showing you how cumbersome it would be if a repeated task required you to type out the same code every time. Sure. So we need a variable uh, called vacation spots. Should also probably spell it correctly. Vacation spots. And it is a value to an array of three strings naming places you'd like to visit. Okay, uh, let's go with Egypt. Mm. What other place would I like to visit? I also misspelled Egypt. Wait, did I misspell? How do you spell Egypt? like this okay yes I did misspell it uh, Egypt then Japan and Nepal then we have to console log all of them okay Console log vacation spots zero one two. Now imagine we had a list of a hundred places on it, logging blah 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 blah. So basically. 4 billion, 4 billion if statements. In the next exercise, you will learn. Yes. Okay. The for loop. Instead of writing out the same code over and over again, loops allow us to tell computers to repeat given block of code on its own. One way to give computers these instructions is with a for loop. The typical for loop includes a, an iterator variable, variable that usually appears in all three expressions. The iterator variable is initialized, checked against the stopping condition, and assigned a new value on each loop iteration. Iterator variables can have any name, but it's best practice to use a descriptive variable name. Okay. <clears throat> so a for loop contains three expressions separated by 
semicolons inside the parentheses. An initialization starts the loop and can also be used to declare the iterator variable. Uh, okay. A stopping condition is the condition that the iterator variable is evaluated against. If the condition evaluates to true, the code block will run. And if it evaluates to false, the code will stop. Uh, so... We do, okay, let's not overthink it just yet. An iteration statement is used to update the iterator variable on each loop. So the loops are quite different than it is on Python. Python. So the for loop let counter equals zero. So this is the start. Then we continue this loop until the counter is less than four, while the counter is less than four, and we increment the counter by one. Every time. Okay, uh, the stopping condition is, hmm? meaning that the loop will run as long as the iterator variable counter is less than four and the iterator statement is counter plus plus. This means after each loop, the, va the value of a counter will increase by one. For the first iteration, counter will... Blah, 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 blah. For the first iteration, counter will equal to zero. The second iteration, counter will equal to one, and so on. The code block is inside of the curly braces. Right, uh, everything else is fairly standard. Okay. So we have to create a program that loops from five to 10 and logs each number to the console. When writing changing loops, there's a chance that our stopping condition isn't met and we get a dreaded infinite loop, which essentially stops our programming, our programming from running anything else. To exit, refresh the page. <coughs> okay, so... For let counter counter equals uh, blah, 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 from five. So five, and then our stopping condition is ten. So counter wait, not a comma. Five counter is more. More than 10 and counter plus plus. Hmm, console log counter. Wait. The cond if the condition evaluates to false, no, to true. Oh, okay, so I have to do this. It's a bit confusing. And we also uh okay this should be 11. yeah this is compared to python so for x in range five eleven 
print x. Yeah, that's... Oh, rage. Range. I mean, the only difference, I guess, is that we have to manually increment the variable every time. Okay, it's not gonna let me play it because it's Python, but. Okay, I need to wrap my head around this, or rather I have to remember Okay, we initialize a variable. We set a condition that equals to that equates to true. And while it's true, the loop will run. As soon as it evaluates to false, it will stop. So when the counter is equal to 11, it will terminate and it's not going to do the last call, the last cycle or whatever. Okay, I'm pretty sure we're, we're going to get plenty of practice. <clears throat> so what if we want the for loop to log 3 to 1 and then 0? With simple modifications to the expression, we can make our loop run backwards. To run a backward for loop, we must set the iterator variable to the highest desired value in the initialization expression. Set the stopping condition for stopping condition for when the iterator iterator variable is less than the desired amount. And the iterator should decrease in intervals after each iteration. Okay. <laughs> so make this for loop that loops make a for loop that loops backwards printing 3 to 0 to the console. Okay. So we'll start at 4. We will do equals to 0 and we will decrement the counter. No. Um, counter is less than no more than one. Right? More or equal to one. Oh, but we're doing it backwards, so we don't need the extra one. So it starts from three. But still, this guy ain't happy. Zero? Oh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, this will take some getting used to. Looping through arrays. For loops, for loops are very handy for iterating over data structures. For example, we can use a for loop to perform the same operation on each element 
on an array. Arrays hold lists of data, like customer names or product information. Imagine we owned a store and wanted to increase the price of every product product in our catalog. That could be a lot of repeating... Ugh. For some reason, I'm having trouble focusing. Uh, arrays hold lists of data, like customer names or product information. Imagine we owned a store and wanted to increase the price of every product in our catalog. That could be a lot of repeating code, but by using our for loop to iterate through the array, we could accomplish this task easily. To loop through each element in the array, a for loop should use the array's length property in its condition. Okay, so we initialize a variable, and while the variable is less than the length of the list, we increment the variable and also print out based on array index positions using that variable. Okay. Okay, I think I need a little, a small break. I'm gonna take a fiver because I'm just having a hard time focusing. So I'll, I'll take a step away a little and, and I'll be back. I'm just gonna pace around my apartment a little bit because the therapy appointment knocked me out of my... We're back. Right, so... Uh, in the loop above, we named our iter iterator variable i. This is a variable naming convention you'll see in a lot of loops. When we use i to iterate through arrays, we can think of it as being shorthand for the word index. Notice how our stopping condition checks that i is less than animal's length. Remember that arrays are zero indexed. We index the index of the last element of the array is equivalent to the length of the array minus one. If we try to access an element at the index of animal's length, we will have gone too far. Uh, sure. <clears throat> with for loops, it's easier for us to work with elements in arrays. Okay, so <clears throat> let's write a for loop. So for uh we let i uh inside the block for the for loop use the console log to log each element in the vacation spots array after the string i would love to visit okay Uh, right, so while I is less than animal's length, I plus plus, uh, right, console log. I would love to visit uh, anim why did I write animal? I meant vacation spots. <coughs> I would love to visit vacation spots I. right? No.
Oh, right. We didn't initialize the variable properly. Okay. It's slowly sinking in. Nested loops. You're moving too fast there. When we have a loop running inside another loop, we call that a nested loop. One use for a nested loop is to compare the elements of two arrays. For each round of the outer for loop, the inner for loop will run completely. Mm-hmm. So we have two loops. We instead we run one for loop. Then we run another for loop, and then we compare. Let's think about what's happening in the nested loop in our example. For each element in the outer loop, the inner loop will run its entirety, comparing the current element from the outer array to each element in the inner array. When it finds a match, it prints a string to the console. Sure, imagine you're a big wig programmer for, <laughs> for a social media platform. You've been tasked with building a prototype for a mutual followers program. You'll need two arrays of friends from two mock users so that you can extract the names of the followers who exist in both lists. Make a variable called Bob's followers and set it to equal to an array with four strings representing the names of Bob's friends. Okay, so Bob's followers equals, uh, say, Mark, uh, John, and Jack F0. Oh, we need four elements in it. Okay, sure, let's do Nathan. Make a variable called Tina's followers and set it to equal with three strings representing the names of Tina's friends. Sure. Tina's followers. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Let's say Josh match exactly two of the same names as two friends in the Bob Swallower array. Okay, so Keck, F, and John. Create a third variable called mutual mutual followers equals empty. Create a nested loop that iterates through Bob's followers as the array for the outer loop and Tina's followers as the array for the inner loop. If the current element from the outer loop is the same as the current element from the inner loop, push the element into the mutual followers array. So for i, uh, no, or let i equals zero. Uh, i is less, i is less than Bob's followers length i plus plus and then we do a second for loop where we let j equal zero j is less than tina's followers dot length and j plus plus 
So if Bob's followers I is equal to Tina's followers J should go into parentheses push the element so it doesn't matter which one we push wait how does the push thing work again Push, 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 push. Wait, where was it? Pop. Here. Push, 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 push. There. Oh, array push. Okay, so mutual followers dot push uh, Bob's followers I. Okay, that's correct. All right, so if we wanted to print uh, console log mutual followers, we get John and Kekpap zero. All right. Straightforward stuff. In the while loop. You're doing great. You're going to teach, uh, we're going to teach you about a different type of loop, the while loop. Let's, uh, to start, let's convert a for loop into a while loop. So we have a for loop. And counter two equals one. Oh, so we just split the whole thing. Uh, we initialize the variable outside of the while loop. We set the condition here and we iterate inside. Or we increment inside. So the counter to variable is declared before the loop. We can access it inside our while loop since it's a globe it's in the global scope. We start our loop with the keyword while followed by our stopping condition or test condition. This will be evaluated before each round of the loop. While the condition evaluates to true, the block will continue to run. Once it evaluates to false, the loop will stop. And finally, we have our loops code block, which prints the counter two to the console and increments counter two. Right, so if we didn't increment it, we'd get an infinite, infinite loop. Uh, yes. So if you're, you may be wondering when to use the while loop, but the syntax of a while loop is an, is ideal when we don't know in advance how many times the loop should run. Think of eating like a what? Think of eating like a while loop. When you start taking bites, you don't know exactly how, you don't know the exact number you'll need to become full. Rather, you'll eat while you're hungry. In situations when we want a loop to execute an under, undetermined number of times, while loops are the best choice. Okay, so... <clears throat> Below the cards array, declare a variable, current card, uh, current card with a let keyword. Oh, uh, <clears throat> but don't assign it a value. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so let's create a while loop while current card does not equal spade. Uh, inside the block of your while loop, add the following line of code. Your current card equals cards math floor math dot random multiplied by four uh, so this will give us a random number which we will use to index the cards array and assign a value of current card to a random element from that array if you notice the run button spinning continuously or a lost connection to the academy messages message in an exercise, you may have an infinite loop. If the stop condition of our loop is never met, we will create an infinite loop which stops our program from running anything else. To exit out of an infinite loop, in an exercise, refresh the page. Okay, so that worked. So we're indexing through the thing while the thing is the thing. Awesome. Your loop is running, but you can't tell because it doesn't output anything. Let's add a console log statement to our while block. Sure thing. Uh, con console log. Log. Why is my keyboard lagging so bad? Current card. Console. Right. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <coughs> Took nine times, six times, first try. All right, next. Do while statements. In some cases, you want a piece of code to run at least once and then loop based on a specific condition after its initial run. This is where the do while statement comes in. Okay, this is new. A do while statement says to do a task once and then keep doing it until, it's, until a specified condition is no longer met. The syntax for a do while statement looks like this. Okay, so we need to initialize the i index outside. Uh, count string equals count string plus i. Then we increment i. <laughs> okay, it's a bit confusing. So in this example, the code block makes changes to the count string variable by appending the string the string form of the i variable to it. Right. First the code block first the code block after the do keyword is executed once. Then the condition is evaluated. If the condition evaluates to true, the block will execute again. The looping stops when the condition evaluates to false. 
<clears throat> Note that the while and do while loops are different. Unlike the while loop, do while will run at least once, whether or not the condition evaluates to true. Okay. So we'd like to program a uh, we'd like to program we'd like a program to stim simulate part of the cake base cake baking process. Depending on the recipe, a different number of cups of sugar is required. Create a variable cups of sugar needed and assign it a number value of your choosing. Sure, probably should do it with let. Um, uh, okay, let's do it with let. Mm, cups of sugar needed. And let's assign that to, say, three. The cups of sugar must be added to the batter one at a time. Declare a variable cups added and assign it a value of zero. Sure, cups added equals zero. When we have a sweet tooth, oh well, we have a sweet tooth, so we want to add at least one cup of sugar to the batter, even if the value of the cup of sugar is needed is zero. Uh, Okay, so do, do what? Which increments cups added by one, while cups added is less than cups of sugar. Okay, so cups added plus equals one while uh, uh, cups added is less than cups of sugar needed. No. Oh, the while has to be outside of parentheses. Okay, in order to help us visualize the output of each iteration of the loop, add a console log within the do while block and log the value of cups added. Or console log cups added. Uh, <laughs> It's a very interesting way to do a while loop, but I mean, it makes sense. Now I'm thinking of Python equivalents to such a while loop. And I can't think of one. Okay, let's move on. Break keyword. So imagine we're looking to adopt a dog. We plan to go to the shelter every day for a year and then give up. <laughs> okay, but what if we meet our dream dog on day 65? We don't want to keep going to the shelter for the next 300 days just because our, uh, just because our original plan was to go for a whole year. In our code, we want to stop a loop from continuing to execute even though the original stopping condition we wrote for our loop hasn't been met. We can use the keyword break. So break keyword allows program to break out of loop uh, within the loops block. Yeah, well, we're familiar with the break statement. So log each element from wrapper array 
in a for loop with the iterator variable i. Okay, so for uh, let i equals zero. Um, wrapper array dot length length is less than i no i is less than the length i is less than length and we just increment i and console log uh, wrapper array i right after the for loop <coughs> log the string and if you don't know now you know to the console uh, After the for loop, console log, and if you don't know, now you know. Add a break inside your loops block that breaks out of the loop if the element at the current index at the current index in the wrapper array is notorious big. So if wrapper array i is e oh no uh, that here equals notorious big. we break don't forget the semicolons um Okay, it did it after Tupac. Why though? Because it's supposed to be going through this. Okay, so it goes little, little Kim. It prints it out, checks if it's notorious B. It isn't. Goes back, goes to Jay Z, prints out Jay Z. If it's, checks if it's notorious B. If it's not, goes back again, prints it out, checks if it's notorious B, and it is, so it should break. Why is it not breaking? Let's take a look. Yeah, I did the same thing. So that's identical. 
that's identical. Uh, that is identical. Wrapper array, Victoria SBIG. Huh. Oh, notorious. Notorious. Didn't like my spelling. Yeah, so then it did not match it exactly. So, okay. I should get into the habit of just copy pasting stuff from arrays. Okay, we're done with loops. So, up next we have a quiz, probably. Yes, we do. So, if you want to run, if you want to run a code block, if you want to run a code block at least once, then loop as long as the condition condition remains true. Which kind of loop would you use? I would use a do while. What is incorrect about the code block? Hmm. We're not. Oh, it should be semicolons, not commas. What is the general purpose of a loop? <clears throat> loops iterate through arrays to find elements. Uh, no. Loops automatically iterate a block of code based on conditions. Sort of. Loops read and recreate code automatically. I wish. All loops help the computer make decisions automatically. I also wish that was the case. What would the output of this block code be? Jesus. So we're looping through and we're printing out letters. And then for each letter, we are also printing out numbers until starting at one. So C1, uh, C123. Yes, because we don't include four. So this is the answer. I swear to God, like JavaScript loops are so much harder to understand than Python loops. Or maybe I'm just stupid. Which statement of the which statement is true about while loops? While loops will run at least once, then will run again if their condition is true. Map wrong. While loops only run while the condition is false. No. While loops evaluate a condition for however long. <sighs> for however long it is true and the loop stops when the condition is false. Mm. Mm, yes. What problem is caused by this code block? Okay, so we start iterating at 10. So while I is more than zero and we're incrementing. 
So infinite loop. Yeah, the code will loop forever because I will always be greater than zero. What will be the result of the block of the code block? Okay, so while social media index is less than the length um, while the social media index is less than the length. Okay, my brain just refuses to work properly today. Uh, we want to log social media, social media index. So, it will just print Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Yes. Oh. Uh. <clears throat> Which statement is true about for loops? For loops always run an unknown number of times. No. For loops always count from zero upwards. Wrong. For loops can never result in an infinite loop. Wrongs. Wrong. For loops are appropriate when looping a predetermined number of times. Yes. What do nested for loops do? Run the same code twice. No. Nested for loops allow us to run multiple for loops at once. Not necessarily at once. <laughs> nested loops are bad because they run forever. Uh, nested loops allow us to double check our if else statements. No. Well, okay, I know this is the right answer, but I would disagree with it because it's technically not at once. Like you're not simultaneously like running two loops. You're running one loop a little bit, and then you run a, another loop until the completion, and then you run the first loop a little bit more and do the same thing again. So, uh. Oh. Oh. Goodness gracious. I can smell the Friday coming. And my brain is already in vacation mode. Ugh. I mean, tomorrow will be a much needed. Uh. Uh. <clears throat> It'll be a much needed break from coding. <sighs> okay, so we have another project. It's time to practice loops in JavaScript by building a project that will translate English into whale talk. Okay, let's take a breeder breather. Here, just do a slight intermission. Because I am swamped. Should I go make some coffee, maybe? But it's kind of late to be drinking coffee. Uh. 
Okay. So, whale talk. Uh, take a phrase like turpentine and turtle. Tur turpentine and turtles. And translate it into its whale talk equivalent. <laughs> there are a few simple rules for translating text to whale language. There are no consonants, only vowels excluding Y. Uh, the U's and the E's are extra long, so we must double them in our program. Once we have converted text to the whale language, the result is sung slowly, as in a cut as in a custom as is a custom in the ocean to accomplish this translation we can use our knowledge of loops let's get started uh, okay so i feel like it's fairly fairly standard fairly simple uh so we want to have a variable called input which will be our whatever we want to translate to whale talk so let's say <clears throat> today is uh friday and my brain refuses to work Right, so that's task one. Whales only speak with the vowels A, E, I, O, U. Using these letters, using these lowercase letters, create an array named vowels. Uh, sure. Const vowels equals uh, A, E, I, O and U. The array will not be updated, so be sure to choose the appropriate declaration keyword. Done. Create a variable named result array. Let result array equals empty array. Create a loop to iterate through each letter in the input variable. In a later step, we will compare each letter with our vowel array. So for <clears throat> I, uh, let I equals zero, while I is less than the uh, input link I plus plus and I assume we need to do two loops to check your work log the iterator number position iterator number position inside a for loop and run your code. This should count the number of characters in your input string. Uh, so console log Osanli console log I. Uh, right. Create a nested for loop inside the for loop you just wrote. Make the inner loop iterate through the vowels array each time the outer loop runs. So for let j equal uh, equal zero. Uh, while j is less less than the uh, vowels link 
and J++. Nope, not here. Uh, here. To check your work. Okay, let's uh, iterate through J, console, log, J. So it should be printing out Yeah, it should be printing out numbers in pairs of five. So zero, one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, four, zero, one, three, two, three, four, for each letter in here. This seems to be, seem to be short. Maybe we, are, we aren't. Okay. Let's delete this. So inside the second for loop, write a code block that compares the input letter to every letter in the vowels array. Um, sure. So if uh, if input input i is equal to vowels j, right? In that case, we console log input i plus uh, vowels j. Yeah. Okay. Now, instead of just logging the letters, add them to the results array. To check your work, print the results array. The letters you logged to the console in step H should be now included in your results array. Uh, so instead of console log, we just do result array dot push. And then console log result array Oof. what is this we got <clears throat> oh we're printing it out every after every single time we should be doing that here Wait, no. Hmm. Oops. Uh, we should be doing that here. Yes. So, whales double their E's and U's in their language. Write an if statement that checks if each letter in the input string is equal to E. If so, use the push method to add input I to the result array. Uh, I feel like I got lost somewhere. Mm.
Um, okay, so we didn't probably need to include this. Um, we just need to do that. And then here we have to check uh, if the input i is equal to e if that's the case we push it onto the results array so result array dot push 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 e so um okay or Unexpected token four. What? No, it's just not happy that I didn't include this. Because if I do just, uh, if I do console log, say E, yeah, then it's going to be fine. But. Okay, let's not use the ternary thingy. Uh, if input i is equal to e, we want to result array dot push Or no, push input i. Yes. Okay, and then we want to <clears throat> do the same thing with the letter U. Uh, so else if else if else if else if uh, input I is equal to U we want to push result ar uh, array push input i mm. so Yeah. Okay. At the bottom of the program, log the results array to the console. Currently results array outputs an array of characters. To produce a proper way language, we want to capitalize array and put them together as one string declare a variable result string so let result string equals result array dot uh what was it split splice slice splice 
spray deleted elements. No. Slice. No. Wait, what just happened? God damn it. Join. Right? Yeah, join. So... Result string equals result array ah, array dot join on empty separate by at the specified separator string uh, but we also need to capitalize can we do that dot to upper case yeah we just need to move that here Oh, it's not printing the thing that we need to print. So console log result string. Yes. Yes, how can I help you? You have food in your bowl. Yes, you do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Been napping the whole day. Now you're ready to play, huh? So... To test if it's working, we have to use this string. And... Let's see. And we got... U-U-E-E-I-E-E-A U U E E. Okay, it works. So, if I wanted to say my dog is looking at me wist wist wistfully wistfully, is that a word? Wistfully. Wistfully. It is a word, wistfully, okay. At me wistfully expecting me to give him more food when he already has a bowl that's, ah, oh, that is half ah, full. That would translate into Oh I O I I O E I E O E I Okay. I'll stop there. Did you get that? Do you understand whale language? No? Well, sex to be you. <clears throat> All right. The four of loop. Oh my god, four of loop? Okay, let's do a break. A proper one, ten minutes. And we'll probably... Uh, let's see.
Oh, we might be able to jump into objects today still. Yeah, because that's a short topic. So we'll jump into objects. And we'll probably finish with that today. So short break. And I will be back soon. All right. Let's do the final push of the day. Ugh. I don't know what it is. It's probably Friday. Having such a hard time focusing and yeah, it's Friday. Having such a hard time focusing today. Then again, I mean, it's not like we're learning quantum computing here. But still. Okay, so... A common task you will encounter when programming is iterating over arrays or array-like objects. As a JavaScript programmer, you may, be, you may already be familiar with the for loop. Yes, I'm familiar. We just learned it. You should know that. Uh, the loop requires a counter, an iteration statement, and a stopping condition to control looping. While powerful, the for loop can be a bit cumbersome to set up, introduces room for errors, and could lead to difficult to read code. Yeah, no shit. No. No schnitzel. Quantum country. For introduction to quantum computing and quantum mechanics. Uh, no thank you, Kek. You go read that. That's above my pay grade. <clears throat> uh, so, as a remedy for some of the for loops shortcomings, the ES6 version of JavaScript introduced the shorter and more concise for of loop. Oh god, this article will outline the benefits of using for of loops and walk through how to use for of loop to iterate through arrays and strings. God darn it. Okay, here's this here's an example of iterating over each element in array using a traditional for loop with an index variable. Okay, standard stuff. I enjoy hobbies. Here's an example of iterating through the same array using for of loop. For. Okay, I'm immediately happy now because this is more akin to. To Python. Like it would be almost identical if we didn't have parentheses and the. Uh, the const, constant thingy, whatever the hell, and the the curly braces. Uh, so it has a simpler syntax, which can be beneficial for code readability, especially in larger and more complex applications. So for fruit of fruits, okay, okay, I I'm behind this one hundred percent. Uh, do, 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 do. iterating through a string or char username, blah 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 blah. Break and continue. Uh, has the advantage of setting up most of our loop parameters for you, but sometimes it's necessary to reclaim some control of how iteration is managed. One way of doing this in JavaScript, in using this. Uh, one way of doing this is using JavaScript's break and continue statements. The break statements can be used to jump out of a loop. Yes. Uh, so we just jump that. And continue statement is used to skip one iteration of the loop. Yes. Okay. So for loop versus for of loop. You might be wondering why use a for loop at all if a for of loop is so much simpler. Well, the for of loop is not a complete replacement for the for loop. Take a look at the following code snippet. Okay, I'm looking. So we have 
uh, i equal nums length minus one. Okay, we we're backwards iterating. So while i is more or equal to zero, console log nums i. So should print three to one and time's up. In the example above, we iterated through an array in reverse. You would not be able to use a for of loop to do the same thing. Would you not? Uh, do, 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 do. I guess not. Hmm. However, with a regular for loop, you have access to indices of the elements. determine a stopping condition and the ability to set a counter. Keep those factors in mind when deciding <coughs> what loop is right for your circumstances. So spelling wizard. Now that we've shown you how to set up and use a for of loop, let's practice with a code challenge by writing some code yourself. All right. So write a program uh, to help us improve our spelling skills. Given the spelling word, use a for of loop to log each letter using console log. Sure. So for uh, char no for const char of spelling spelling word spelling word. We want a console log. Uh, char. Yep. Pokemon Catcher. Iterates through our Pokemon list array. Inside the block, use console log and string interpolation as modeled above to log each element in the, po in the Pokemon array with the string you caught a X. One of the elements, Yoshi, is not a Pokemon. If you encounter Yoshi, you continue to skip this element before it gets logged to the console. All right. Uh, so for um, so for Pokemon in Pokemon of Pokemon list of. Pokemon list. If Pokemon equals Yoshi, that should probably be in parentheses. If Pokemon equals Yoshi, then we simply continue. Otherwise, I guess we can just do else. Else console log Pokemon. Yep. Yippity, yippity, yep. Oh, I need to log a proper string. Uh, you caught a Pokemon. Exclamation mark. <coughs> Okay, this is a I, I I'm down with this syntax more than the normal for loop. But I guess I'll get used to it. Alright. 
let's look at objects. Hmm. Kind of hesitant to start this this beefy of a topic today. I guess we can just skim through the uh, theory. It's time to learn more about the basic structure of permeates, a basic structure that permeates nearly every aspect of JavaScript programming. Objects. You're probably already more comfortable with objects than you think, because JavaScript loves objects. Many components of the language are actually objects under the hood, and even the parts that aren't, like strings or numbers, can still act like objects in some instances. There are only seven fundamental data types in JavaScript, and six of, six of those are the primitive data types, string, number, boolean, null, undefined, and symbol. With the seventh type, objects, we open our code to more complex possibilities. We can use JavaScript objects to model, model real-world things, like a basketball, or we can use objects to build data structures that make the web possible. Yes. At the core, JavaScript objects are containers storing related data and functionality. But that deceptively simple task is extremely powerful in practice. Or extremely difficult in practice. You've been using the power of objects all along, but now it's time to understand the mechanics of objects and start making your own. Okay, so creating object literals. Objects can be assigned to variables, just like any JavaScript type. We use curly braces to designate an object literal. Um, okay. Uh, we fill an object with unordered data. This data is organized into key value pairs. A key is like a variable name that points to a location in memory that holds a value. You're just describing a dictionary. Uh, key's value can be found, can be of any data type in the language, including functions or other objects. We make key value pair by writing the key's name or identifier followed by a colon and then the value. We separate each key value pair in an object literal with a comma with a comma. Hey, no wall lounging. Get out of the wall. Get off the wall. Off the wall, I said. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, no wall lounging for you. Are you sad now that I don't allow you to wall lounge? Okay, uh, so keys are strings, but when we have a key that does not have any special characters in it, JavaScript's, JavaScript allows us to omit the quotation marks. I guess a space is a special character. Hmm. Okay, so the spaceship object has two properties, fuel type and color. That is a special character, but fuel type doesn't have that character. So why do we need quotation marks around it?
Yeah, see, see, sometimes even I'm right. Uh, okay, so the spaceship has two properties, fuel type and color. Fuel type has quotation mark because it contains... Let's make some objects. Uh, so the spaceship we have so far looks good. Looks good, but unfortunately it's not very fast at hyperspace travel due to having inferior fuel storage. Make a new spaceship object named faster ship with the same color as spaceship, but with a fuel type equal to turbo fuel. Uh, okay, so... <clears throat> I assume we're initializing the object with let because otherwise we would not be able to change its properties. Is that the case? Uh, so let space ship equals so we do fuel type turbo fuel and color as silver No. Oh, faster ship. Uh, faster ship. Mm. Okay. I mean, for consistency's sake, I would just add these everywhere and then do this also. I don't know, just something irks me with the fact that with this. Just, it don't look right. Okay, so accessing properties. There are two ways we can access an object's property. Let's explore the first way. Dot notation. Text editor probably has better syntax highlighting. Probably. Use underscores for keys. Without white space. Oh. So instead of instead of spacebar, you mean? Hmm. I guess makes sense. Yeah. Then you don't have to. You don't have to use the quotation marks ever. So we've used dot notation to access the properties and methods of built-in objects and data instances. Right. With property dot notation, we write the object's name followed by the dot operator and then the property name key. Okay, so we access it by the key. Uh, if we try to access property that does not exist on that object, undefined will be returned. So let's get some more practice. Let's use the dot operator to access the value of num crew from the spaceship object. Uh, so create a variable. Uh, crew count equals so spaceship dot num crew. Yeah. Okay. Again, use the dot operator, create a variable planet array. Const planet array 
equals and assign the spaceship splite path property to it. So spaceship dot light light path. Okay, nothing crazy. Nothing mind boggling. Bracket notation. The second way to access a key, key's value is by using bracket notation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to use bracket notation to access the object's property, we pass in the property name as a string. Ah. So we must use bracket notation when accessing keys that have numbers, spaces, or special characters in them. Okay, so that's also useful to use um, underscores, because then you never have to use bracket notation. It just adds more consistency, I guess. So with bracket notation, you can also use a variable a, a variable inside the brackets to select the keys of an object. Wait, what? With bracket notation, you can also use a variable inside the brackets to select the keys of an object. So here we have a function which returns a property. Oh, oh, okay, I understand. So if we try to write or return any prop function with dot notation, the computer would look for a key of prop name on our object and not the value of prop name parameter. <laughs> mm hmm. Okay, so let's use bracket notation to access the value of active emission from the spaceship object in the code editor. Let's create a variable is active and assign the spaceship's active mission property to it. Uh, do, 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 is active equals spaceship. Uh, act. Oh, we need to use it in brackets. Active mission, like so. Yes, using bracket notation and the prop name variable provided. Console log the value of the active mission property. Ba, 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 ba. What? Using bracket notation and the prop name variable provided, console log the value of active mission property. So console log is active. Oh. Okay. Property assignment. Once we've defined an object, 
We're not stuck with all the properties we wrote. Objects are mutable, meaning we can update them after we create them. We can use either dot notation or bracket notation and the assignment operator to add a new key value pair to an object or change an existing property. Okay, so one of the two things can happen with property assignment. If the property already exists on the object, whatever value it held before will be replaced with a newly assigned value. Um, <laughs> with the newly assigned value. Whatever value it held, newly assigned. Okay. Uh, if there's no property with that name, a new property will be added to the object. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so... Right, I get it. It is important to know that although we can't reassign or uh, reassign an object declared with const, we can still mutate it, meaning we can add new properties and change the properties, properties that are there. Okay. So we can still ch like mutate the object even if it's assigned with cons, but we won't be able to override it. Okay. Uh, you can delete property from an object with the delete operator. Delete operator. Delete. Delete? What? What is this? Delete, just delete? Okay. Let's reassign the color property of spaceship object to have a value of glorious gold. So space, spaceship dot uh, color equals glorious, glorious gold. Right. And without changing lines one to six, add a number of engines property with a numeric value between one and 10 to the spaceship object. So space ship dot engines, num engines, num engines equals, let's give it 10. new uh, oh not a string 10 but here's the thing about adding properties like that is then it probably becomes extremely difficult to track them what's been added, what's been taken away. So it's better to just initialize all your properties from the get-go, because then you'll have them all in one place. <laughs> delete. Use the delete operator to remove secret mission property from the spaceship object. Right, so delete uh, spaceship dot secret uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, uh, secret mission. Yeah, like if this was a huge block of code, like thousands of lines long, and in the top you see that you have this spaceship object with a secret mission, you're going to have to sift through the entire code code and check whether it's been deleted somewhere or whether new properties have been added. Maybe they have a solution for that, but... Okay, methods. 
when the data stored on an object is a function, we call that a method. A property is what an object has, while a method is what an object does. Do object methods seem familiar? That's because you've been using them all along. For example, console is a global JavaScript object and log is a method on that object. Math, also, math is also a global JavaScript object and floor is a method on it. We can include methods in our object literals by creating ordinary colon separated key value pairs. They serve as our method's name while the value is an anonymous function expression. But, so, uh, we initialize an object, and that's a function somehow? With the new method syntax introduced in E6, we can omit the colon and the function keyword. Oh my God. Okay. Invade, just, just invade. <clears throat> I guess that's simpler. Object methods are invoked by appending the object's name with the dot operator followed by the method name and parentheses. Oh, okay. Uh, below the retreat message variable in the code editor, create an alien ship object. So const alien ship equals bam. It should contain a method retreat which will console log the retreat message. So retreat uh, console log retreat message. Now let's add another object method. Uh, take off should console log the string console log Just copy paste this. Don't forget the semicolons. Spim Gorp Glicks Blast Off. Uh, wait, what? Hmm. Unexpected identifier. What's the problem? Wait, what? You need a comma? Between the methods? What kind of shenanigany stuff is this? Oh, 
Okay. Let's invoke alien ship dot retreat and alien ship dot take uh, og take og. Ugh. Okay, things to keep in mind. We can simplify the functions like methods like so. We definitely need a comma after method, between methods, I mean. Okay, so what if I wanted, so then the syntax of writing a full object would probably be initializing your properties at the very top or at the bottom, no, at the top. Uh, and then initializing or writing your methods one after each other at the bottom. That's what I'm imagining. Oh my god, nested objects. In application code, uh, objects are often nested. An object might have another object as a property which in turn could have a property that's an array of even more objects. And then you get completely lost in your code and you don't know what the hell's going on. So in our spaceship object, we want a crew object. This will contain all the crew members who do important work on the craft. Each of those crew members are objects themselves. They have properties like name and degree, and they have each, and they each have unique methods based on their roles. We can also nest other objects in the spaceship, such as a telescope, or nest details about the spaceship's computers inside a parent nanoelectronics object. God. We can chain operators to access nested properties. We'll have to pay attention to which operator makes sense to use in each layer. It can be helpful to pretend you are the computer and evaluate each expression from left to right so that each operation starts to feel a little more manageable. Spaceship nanoelectronics backup battery. Returns lithium. I guess it kind of makes sense, but it looks very daunting right now. In the preceding code, first the computer evaluates spaceship now nanoelectronics, which results in an object containing the backup and computer objects. We access the backup object by appending backup. The backup object has a battery property accessed with battery which returned the value stored there. <clears throat> okay, so create a variable uh, called app fave and assign the captain's favorite food. Make sure to use bracket and dot notation to get the value of food through the nest through nested access. Okay, so we need to let's take a look. We have passengers, we have telescope, and we have crew. So cap fave equals spaceship dot crew. So inside the crew, we have the captain. We just have the captain. 
so dot captain wait no or yes Maybe captain. Um, favorite foods and the element in the zeroth index of her favorite foods array. So zero. No. Uh, Wait, so we have passengers. That's a parameter. And then we have that as a parameter. Then that as a parameter so we're accessing crew okay so within crew we have to access captain yes and then within captain we access favorite foods And we get the zeroth, zeroth element in the resulting array. Uh, so technically, this should be correct. Spaceship crew captain favorite foods will give us access to the array of the captain's favorite foods. But there's one additional step to get to the first item in that array. I don't understand. Pretty variable cap fave. Cap fave. And assign the captain's favorite food, which is the element in the zeroth index of her favorite foods array. Cannot read property zero of undefined. Spaceship crew captain favorite foods and then zero hmm Let uh, 
Oh, I I favorite. This is where Code Academy kind of sucks because they really hound you over grammatical errors. Okay, right now the passenger's property has a value of null. Instead, assign as its value an array of objects. These objects should represent a spaceship passengers as individual objects. Yeah, I know, they could. And it's not the first time I get hung up on such an error. And it takes quite a long time to figure out. And then you start messing with your code. If you have more code, you start around messing around with your code. And then you notice the spelling error. And then you have to redo everything everything that you did to your code. It's, it's a bit of a hassle. So right now, the passenger property has instead assigned it as a value, blah, 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 blah. These objects should represent spaceship passengers as individual objects. Make at least one passenger object in the array that has at least one key value pair on it. Um, bum, 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 bum. Okay, so... <clears throat> we first have to access spaceship. Spaceship dot passengers dot passengers. Then as that we assign we need to assign uh, an array of objects. And you do an object by simply uh, by simply saying like hmm, mark wait no mark and then age 20 like this you know I'm looking at I'm looking at objects here uh, that's an object, right? Wait. That's a property. That's also a property. That's a property. Where are the objects? Is this an object? Module. Yes. Oh, so maybe instead of mark, we do let mark and then equals um, I feel like I need the cheat sheet here just to recall what how to instantiate an object Do 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 uh part two of java syntax and we have objects where's my cheat sheet there Oh, DM Mulroy, thank you for the raid with 78 people. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the stream. 
We're learning some JavaScript. Hello. Damn. We're getting flooded up here. Hello, everyone. Hope everybody is having a great Friday. My condolences on JavaScript. Yeah, we're, we're just we just jumped into objects and I'm kind of racking my brain on this one a little bit. Uh, because we're trying to assign objects to other objects. Skip that. Go all functional. <laughs> yeah, I know, Kek. I'm being raided. I mean, I it's it makes it easier because I already know some Python, so it's not it's not completely uh, just new knowledge, but but still, it's it's the syntax that's tripping me up. Damn, I'm gonna have to stream a bit longer. Because now I'm gonna have to raid somebody else. I I was I was pretty much done streaming, but 24 hour stream, let's go. I would not survive. <clears throat> Hello, Exceldro. Oh, okay. Let's put this JavaScript thing to bed. Because my brain is spinning from today. I mean, we did quite a bit. We, we did... Um, we learned about functions. Tonchak, thank you for the follow. I should probably move this following thing here. Uh, we learned about functions, we learned about scope, data types, variables. We built a couple of projects, like number guesser. Uh, we did arrays, we did loops. Time to learn some Rust. I was actually looking to, like, because I before this I did a uh, a Code Academy course on data types and algorithms, and after that I was like thinking about what should I learn next, and Rust is Rust was one of the options. It was between Ruby and Rust, and then I don't know I came. It came across the backend engineering course on Codecademy, and I was like, okay, this is this seems more, um, I don't know, aligned with my my goals at the moment. So I started doing this instead. Skip Ruby and go to Elixir. It's the first time I'm hearing about Gleam, to be honest. Let's take a look. Gleam. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I'm seeing some marketing apps running on the battle-tested Erlang virtual machine that powers planet-scale systems such as WhatsApp and Ericsson. Gleam is new. Gleam is a friendly language for, for building type safe systems that scale. Okay. It looks like a blob here. Blob as the mascot. Learn the language that fits best with the things you want to make. Yeah, I mean, I have nothing specific uh in mind at the moment honestly i'm just exploring different things i did a little bit of python i learned django made a couple of websites with django 
uh, then I realized that I was kind of lacking in data st data structures and algorithms because I was sort of interested in solving some of lead code uh, exercises and it's kind of hard without having that knowledge. So then I did the course on uh, data structures and algos. Uh, didn't solve any lead code exercises after that, or didn't try to solve any. And then I just jumped into this course. So after this course, I'll, pro I'll probably look into building some more robust uh, projects. One of, one of the project ideas that I had, and it's inspired by something I saw on Reddit, was that some guy built a, a program that tracks uh, how much time politicians spend on their phone uh, while in the while while at while at work? What's the word? Wait. Mm. While at 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 sessions or at meetings. So I was thinking about doing a variation of that. A time tracker, yeah. I did a little mini project using Django where I made a to-do app. But now I'm thinking, no, I didn't host it anywhere. It's only local. Python is good for lead code? Yeah, that's, that's what I did the lead code exercises with. But it's kind of slow, so you will be consistently, most likely consistently ranking in the middle in terms of speed. If you ever want, has, want some help with JSTS or just to bounce off ideas, feel free to hit me up anywhere. Lamar, thank you for the follow. Uh, sure. DM. Um, bu -bu 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 -bum. Yeah, I'll definitely check you out. After the stream. I don't know, I'm, I'm too... I'm kind of sad that I... That you guys rated towards the end of my stream. Or today, specifically. Because tomorrow, we're gonna do gaming. Uh... We do programming during the during the week, and then we do gaming in the weekends. DM, thank you for the follow. So tomorrow we'll be gaming. Probably gonna be gaming either uh, either Elden Ring or Hell Let Loose, or maybe something else. So if you guys want to check that out, you can join me. First learn, race later, yeah. No, but it's a, it's a good thing, because uh, racing helps learn as well, no? Because you do an exercise, and then you try to optimize it. It's what we did with Keck today. We did a... I can actually show it, I think. Let's take a look. Uh, where was it? Yeah, we did this number guesser game. And we basically, uh, yeah, so basically wrote these functions and then refactor them. And that's how we learned quite a bit. And even Keck, who's, I don't know, studying quantum mechanics on his spare time, learned something new. So that was pretty fun. Hmm. Computer wins. He always does. Okay, let's take a look. Um, if you guys want 
some programming, though I'm pretty sure Will is streaming Final Fantasy right now. But we could try to raid him today. I tried raiding him yesterday, but he has his settings set so that only people who have been streaming for whose channels are older than 30 days uh, can raid. So maybe, and he, he said he changed it yesterday. So maybe we can raid him. But I don't know what to tell you guys. I, I would like to do more programming, but I've been doing it since eight in the morning, which was eight hours ago, roughly. So I don't have any more steam in me for that. And gaming, I can't really do at the moment because I'll have to go cook dinner. So I'll leave you in the capable hands of Will the Fool. And I will see the rest of you if you want to join me tomorrow at 2 p.m. GMT plus 2 time. And if you're curious, uh, some of my mods, excluding the one, the one today, uh, should all already be on my YouTube channel. Yeah, definitely DM. We'll probably be learning either more JavaScript or we'll be taking our exam on JavaScript because there is a Java, uh, there are exams built into Code Academy. So one or the other, we'll see. All right, Kekpep and everybody else, thank you for coming out today. It was real pleasure. It was real fun. Uh, I will see you all tomorrow. Yeah, we can raid. Okay. <laughs>